Greetings from the great state of Alaska. My name is Dr. G, and today I want to share with you a message of hope. We're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 79 today. Now, this is a very short psalm. It's only about 13 verses long. However, we're only going to be looking at the first half of this psalm this week, and that's because I'm going to use a lot of other scriptures uh, as we go into this particular chapter. You know, this psalm, it, it is written or attributed to Asaph, who was a worship leader or the worship director under David. However, it's important to note that this psalm is actually describing a desolate Jerusalem after it was destroyed by the Babylonians. And so, from a historicity perspective, Asaph was not alive at that time. And so there's, there's two possibilities regarding the authorship of this psalm. And, and number one, it's possible that there was a second music director by the name of Asaph. That's a possibility. Number two uh, is that maybe it was a member of the worship team, uh, a descendant of Asaph, who wrote this psalm. And, and that's kind of what I think. Maybe it was a descendant of Asaph and from the house of Asaph, and so this was attributed uh, to the worship director's house. In any case, we're going to start, we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2 to start with. So I'm going to give you just a minute to turn there. Psalm chapter 79. I'm going to be reading from the NIV today. Hallelujah. And here's what it says, verses 1 and 2. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have given the dead bodies of your servants as food to the birds of the air, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. And so it's pretty descriptive language here. You know, the Babylonian Empire, it, it grew as nations were conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar. So as these nations were, were conquered and, and fell under Babylonian rule, the army began to change. It, it, the army was a cosmopolitan army. These nations who had been conquered, those soldiers became part of the Babylonian Empire, part of that army. So Nebuchadnezzar's army was ultimately comprised of nations. And that's why we see a reference to the nations here, the nations he had conquered. And so when, when Babylon invaded Jerusalem around 607 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, he did it with an army comprised of soldiers from other nations. And if we go back and we look at some of the chronicles of of events that happened to Israel. In particular, if we go to 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 1, it says that during Jehoiakim's reign, now remember Jehoiakim was a king of Judah, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years, but then he changed his mind and rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And so there was kind of this ebb and flow of, of how Israel, or in particular Judah, uh, engaged the, the king of Babylon. And so if we continue to read 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25, we, we read how Babylon captured the king of Judah. Let, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 25. Second Kings chapter 25, verse 9. And here, here's what it says. It says, He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. <laughs> and this is a description of what King Nebuchadnezzar did 
to Israel, to Judah, when he finally came in that second time because he got tired of the rebellion and he just basically came in to Jerusalem. He, he burnt down the temple. He captured the king. Um, it, it was a, a terrible scene. The, the carnage and destruction was unimaginable. And so that's the backdrop of Psalm chapter 79. So let's continue to look at Psalm chapter 79. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of reproach to our neighbors, of scorn and derision to those around us. And so this verse, it, it references the exile of the Israelites as they were basically, they were kidnapped. They were taken from their homes and they were taken to Babylon. It kind of reminds me of what Hamas did to uh, a lot of these uh, Jewish people last October. They came in and they basically kidnapped these people and took them back to their homeland. And so this this verse is, is, is a reference to that. And only the poor the sick and the weak were left behind. They weren't worth kidnapping. They were left behind to tend to the rubble and the corpses of those who were killed. And of course, blood stained the city and the surrounding areas. The destruction of the temple, it was, it was so fast. It happened so fast and it was so brutal that the surrounding nations were actually surprised at what had happened to Israel. And we have to remember that a lot of Israel's neighbors, they weren't the friendly sort. They were actually Israel's enemies as well. And so they likely celebrated when they heard of Judah's defeat and the destruction of the temple. Let's look at verse 5. How long, O Lord, will you... I'm sorry. How long, O Lord... Will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? You know, we can relate this question. This is, the psalmist is asking a question. How long, O oh Lord? And so we can relate to this question as we often suffer the unimaginable in our own lives, don't we? We, we suffer things. Perhaps a cancer diagnosis for a child that comes out of nowhere. A brain tumor. Something that just comes out of nowhere. And these are things that I've experienced with our family members. Not uh, immediate family, but in our distance family. Or, or maybe a car wreck that takes the life of a young mother. Or divorce that is brought on by an unfaithful spouse. You know, any number of things can contribute to a crisis in our lives. Anything. And so our response to such crises, it says something about our faith. Our response, the way that we uh, interact and engage Almighty God says something about our faith. And, and oftentimes it's important to note that we cause our own crisis by going against the will of God. In other words, we make our own trouble sometimes by making bad decisions, by, by doing things that we know uh, is an act of rebellion. It's a sinful thing. Uh, some of our suffering is, is brought on by just willful disobedience and rebellion against the things of God. It's that simple. And that's what happened to Judah in, in this event that we're reading about. Israel brought about its own judgment. It brought about this destruction. And, and all we have to do is go back to the prophet Jeremiah to look at some of this. Matter of fact, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. We're going to look verses 9 through 11. Now the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah, and this is what he says. The Lord said to me, there is a conspiracy among the people of Judah 
and those who live in Jerusalem. They have returned to the sins of their forefathers, who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them, both the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken the covenant that I made with their forefathers. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Verse 12, the towns of Judah and the people of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods to whom they burn incense, but they will not help them at all when disaster strikes. And so we can see here how the prophet, he, he, he was foretelling the events that was going to happen to Jerusalem. There was going to be a disaster. There was going to be something terrible that was going to happen because Israel over and over sinned against the Lord. They sinned against God. They, they knew they were sinning. They knew they were going against God. They were rejecting his covenant and they continued to do it anyway. And, and I think last week we talked about the covenant that God made with Israel through Moses. And it was a powerful covenant. It was a covenant that uh, expressed blessing if they would keep uh, the commands of God and if they would be obedient and serve the Lord. But then there was also uh, a curse that was associated with that covenant if they would disobey God and go against his will. And that's exactly what they did. And so Israel, they, they were engaged in idolatry. That was one of the big sins. They, they put things before God. They had other gods. They worshipped other gods. And this immediately put them at odds with God. Remember, God is a jealous God. And in the Ten Commandments, he told them, don't put any other gods before me. I'm a jealous God. And in Jeremiah chapter 25, we're going to continue to look at Jeremiah a little bit here. The prophet tells Judah what is coming and why. And so let, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 25. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 25. Let's just go to verse 1. We're going to read the first 10 verses. It says, The word came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Remember, we read about Jehoiakim earlier. Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And so Jeremiah the prophet said to all the people of Judah and to all those living in Jerusalem, for 23 years from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, the word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. You see, God has given multiple chances, multiple opportunities to Israel to repent, but they don't listen. Verse 4, And though the Lord has sent all his servants, the prophets, to you again and and again, you have not listened or paid any attention. And they said, turn now, each of you, from your evil ways and your evil practices. And you can stay in the land the Lord gave to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not follow other gods to serve and worship them. Do not provoke me to anger with what your hands have made. And then I will not harm you. Verse 7. But you did not listen to me, declares the Lord. And you have provoked me with what your hands have made, and you have brought harm to yourselves. Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, Because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord. And I will bring them against this land, and its inhabitants, and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones, and the light of the lamp. 
And so when Asaph, in, in Psalm chapter 79, when he asked the question, how long? This is a reasonable question because the question, it, it acknowledges the fate without giving up the faith. Let, let me say that again. Asaph's question, how long, O Lord? This question acknowledges their fate without giving up the faith. You see, fate is a fact. Fate is something we all experience. The paths that we walk, our actions, our behaviors, our decisions, our choices, it determines our fate. And so fate is a fact, but faith is also a fact. Amen. The Bible says you reap what you sow. We can't change that. That's what the Bible says. It's a, it's a biblical principle. You reap what you sow. When you sow disobedience and rebellion and disrespect toward the things of God, well, you're not going to reap a blessing. You know, the Bible, it also says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God, over again, over and over, he's giving people an opportunity to repent. Because you see, as long as you're alive and you're breathing and you, you, your, your cognitive abilities are intact, you can make decisions. You can make good decisions. You can repent, walk away from your sin, and return to God. Like the prodigal son, he made some bad decisions, but he repented and he returned. You can do that as long as you're alive. Once you stop breathing, you no longer have a chance or an opportunity to repent. And then your fate is completely sealed. Okay, let's look at verses 6 and 7. Psalm chapter 79. Hallelujah. Verses 6 and 7. I have to turn back there. Here we go. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and destroyed his homeland. <laughs> this prayer, this prayer is remarkably similar to Jeremiah's prayer. <clears throat> In Jeremiah chapter 10. Let, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 10. I, like I said, I, we're going back and forth, but this, these scriptures are so closely related. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. This is called Jeremiah's prayer. I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own, for it is not for man to direct his steps. Correct me, Lord, but only with justice, not in your anger, lest you reduce me to nothing. Verse 25, pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the peoples who do not call on your name, for, for they have devoured Jacob. They have completely devoured him and destroyed his homeland. And so we see that this passage of Scripture in Jeremiah chapter 10 is very similar to verses 6 and 7 that I just read in Psalm chapter 79. You know, this prayer that Jeremiah prays, this prayer is answered as evidenced by history. We can look at the history of Babylon. And the answer is also referenced in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 through 14. Let's, let's go there. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and I will make it desolate forever. I will bring upon that land all the things I have spoken against it, 
all that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations and great kings. I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. Wow, I just love scripture. I love how God keeps his word. Amen. God keeps his word. You know, we're going to stop here for today. Like I said, this is a very short psalm, but it, it has these uh, references, these tentacles that go throughout the scripture. And so it's almost impossible to study this psalm without going to the book of Jeremiah. And so, like I said, we're going to stop here for now. I think this is a good opportunity for me to point out that God gave Israel many opportunities to repent and return. Israel could have avoided this crisis just by turning from their sin and throwing themselves into the arms of a merciful God. God is so merciful. He's rich in mercy is what the Bible says. He's a God of judgment, but he's rich in mercy. And I don't read anywhere that it says God is rich in wrath, but he is wrathful against sin, but he's rich in mercy. Yeah, Israel, they didn't seize the opportunity. They just continued in their sin. You know, today you might find yourself in a similar position. Perhaps you're at odds with God over a particular sin. Maybe he's been calling you to a place of repentance over this thing in your life. It might be a little thing to you, but it might be that thing that's keeping you from going deeper with God. And perhaps God is, is dealing with you on some issues. It's time to repent. Amen. It's time to get it under the blood. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that can address our sin. He doesn't just cover our sin, but he takes away our sin. Praise God. And so the blood of Jesus is the one thing that is, is uh, capable of bringing you into complete fellowship with your Father. You have to get your sins under the blood. You have to repent. If this is you, I want to invite you to say a prayer with me today. It's a simple prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I admit that I have these sins. I've had them for a long time. I've tried to fix it, solve it myself. But I need you to do it. I bring this to you. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. I ask you, Jesus, cover my sins with your blood and take away my sin. I repent today. I repent for whatever this thing is that has caused there to be a wall between me and you. I repent and I return to you, Jesus. I return to you. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me to overflowing so that I might walk in the Spirit and not Fulfill the lust of the flesh. I love you, Lord. I'm yours. I serve you alone. I have no idols before you. You are my Lord. Amen. And so if you prayed that prayer, if you prayed that from your heart, then, then those things that are keeping you from going deeper with God, those things are diminished now. But now you have to walk in it. Amen. You've repented of your sin. Don't go back to it. It's in the past. Don't look back. Look forward. Go forward with God. Amen. God bless you.